Okay, I am going to set myself a timer and say what a pleasure it is to be here back at the Levy Institute where I spent some time back in 1997, 1998 as a visiting scholar and um, started doing some of the work that Dimitri talked about earlier. Randy was working on his book, Understanding Modern Money, which you just heard about. Matt Forstatter, who you'll hear from in a day or two, I guess, uh, was down the hall from me. Randy was across the hall from me. And it was such an exciting time to be here because we were scurrying around, probably mostly me scurrying, uh, digging through, you know, the literature and discovering or rediscovering things that were compatible with the kinds of things that Warren Mosler was saying, which at the time seemed entirely new and different and wrong in some sense. And we were wrestling with these ideas and going back through and reading Smith or reading Koletsky or reading and saying, but some of this, this has been said before. Abba Lerner had this, or Adam Smith had this part, or James Tobin had this part. And putting it all together and synthesizing a lot of the ideas that were inspired by the work of Warren Mosler. And so, you know, I started writing uh, a couple of papers while I was here that were then later published that became, I think, sort of important early contributions to what became MMT. And so you're going to hear a lot about this. You're going to hear a lot about sovereign money. And Randy's going to do that next. So I'm not going to spend time on that. Eric Tamoyne, who is somewhere, is going to talk a lot about Treasury Fed, monetary operations coordination. I'm not going to do that. What I would like to do is um, I've titled this The Deficit Myth, which is the title of my book. But I said, let's talk about recessions and what gives rise to recessions and how we have gotten out of recessions. And I'm just going to confine my remarks to the recessions that we have experienced so far this century. Okay, so a tale of four recessions. But just foundationally, and Dimitri covered a lot of this, the basic ideas that undergird where I come from and the lens or the framework that I'm using, which of course is MMT, is let's begin by recognizing that the federal government's budget doesn't work like a household budget, that issuers of what you're going to hear about as a sovereign currency, that they can behave in ways that households, private businesses, state, local governments, provinces cannot. Okay. So they can't run out of money. All right. They can't go broke, but there is a constraint. There is a limit. And so the relevant constraint is a real resource constraint. It's an inflation constraint. So what we want to recognize is that in MMT, like in functional finance, the goal of policy is not to orient macroeconomic policy to achieving a balanced budget, but rather to achieving a balanced economy. And if it takes a budget balance that looks like this, that is the government is spending more than tax revenue, and that delivers a balanced economy, then we ought to accept, welcome, embrace the deficit that allows you to achieve the macroeconomic goals of full employment and low and stable inflation. We'll get to inflation. All right. So you heard and you saw the mathematics, right? The equation that Godley used to do the sector financial balance analyses. In my book, I sort of make it simple because I wanted to make it accessible to a broader audience of readers. So I introduced these three buckets, which is really just Godley's model in picture form. And so we'll talk a little bit about why this is important and why it's important to think about the government's budget, not in isolation, but in the context of all the other balance sheets in the economy, right? And how the government's budget outcome is impacted by and impacts other players in the economy, the private sector and the rest of the world. Okay, this obsession that we have long had, policymakers and others, obsessing over budget outcomes, balanced budgets, budget deficits being the enemy. This idea that what fiscal policy ought to do is orient itself in ways that are designed to reduce deficits, to bring about balanced budgets, and surplus is even the better, right? Well, historically, we know that this tends not to end well. In periods where governments have run budget surpluses and paid down debt, historically, this has led to either 
a depression or a very bad recession. And we'll talk about why that is, okay? So first recession of this century was of course 2001. We're doing this for the US case. In some cases, these are recessions that are experienced globally as well. 2001, let's talk about the lead up to this recession. Okay, we're in the mid 1990s. People recognize who this is? Former Labor Secretary under Bill Clinton, this is uh, Bob Reich, Robert Reich, okay, and a uh, Labor Secretary under Clinton. And he says, this is in the middle of the 1990s, we have a Goldilocks recovery underway. It's not too hot, it's not too cold. We have high productivity growth, lots of job creation, inflation is low. This is a great economy. And he says, President Clinton's economic strategy has been a roaring success a roaring success. So who are the masterminds of the Clinton strategy? Well, largely these folks. Hey, Bob Rubin there in the background over one of Greenspan's shoulders, Treasury Secretary. You recognize Larry Summers, who was Deputy Treasury Secretary at the time. And then, of course, Alan Greenspan. Greenspan comes in. Bill Clinton had run for president on a platform that included some pretty ambitious spending programs. We wanted to do infrastructure and education and healthcare and all this kind of stuff. Alan Greenspan says, no, no, no. You don't want to do those things. What you want to do is focus on reducing the deficit. Okay? And he convinces Clinton that this is good economic policy and this is the way to bring about like a, a very healthy economy. And so Clinton abandons a lot of the campaign promises that were made and shifts his attention to reducing the deficit. So by 1998, the budget is in fact in surplus for the first time in about 30 years. The federal government's budget has moved into surplus, widely hailed by both Democrats and Republicans as a real success story. What an achievement. We have finally rid ourselves of this nasty fiscal deficit that's been nagging us for about three decades. We have finally shown what it looks like to be fiscally responsible, not just a balanced budget, but in fact, budget surpluses. Okay, but bear in mind what Minsky, I'm sorry, what when Godley told us to think about the government's deficit not in isolation, but in the context of all other balance sheets. So in godly sector financial balance framework, what that means is if the government's budget moves into surplus as it did in 1998, and the rest of the world is also in surplus relative to the US because the US has large current account deficits, the rest of the world is in surplus, that leaves only one possible option for the US private sector which was that the US private sector had to be in the deficit position. And this is all happening while everyone is celebrating the Clinton surpluses. Not just celebrating the Clinton surpluses, but looking into the future and anticipating that those surpluses would continue indefinitely. For more than a decade, the Congressional Budget Office looked into its crystal ball and said, the federal government is going to be running budget surpluses as far as the eye can see. And at some point, we will retire the national debt. The White House puts out right, a press release in 2000 saying by 2013, the US will basically be debt free. We will have retired the entire national debt. Okay, so they wanna have a party and celebrate. So what do they do? Well, the White House uh, Council of Economic Advisors each year puts out the economic report of the president. So they start drafting the economic report of the president and chapter two is titled Life After Death, uh, Death, Life After Debt, Life After Debt. So they're saying, let's put this in the economic report of the president, chapter two, a life after debt. And we'll tell everybody how magnificent it's going to be when we retire the national debt. So they draft the chapter and somewhere along the line, people start to freak out because they start wondering, well, without a national debt, that means no treasury market. Like there are no US treasuries because that's what the national debt so-called is, right? The outstanding stock of US treasuries. So they start thinking this through and they say, how's the Fed supposed to conduct monetary policy without treasuries? They were relying on open market operations to, set interest rates, right? Buying and selling US treasuries. So 
Well, we're, how are we going to set the interest rate if we don't have treasuries? And also, it's the benchmark. You know, it's the risk-free rate against which other risk assets are priced. So how are we supposed to do? So these memos go back and forth, and all of a sudden they decide we don't want this to be in the economic report of the president. So they bury this chapter. The only reason we know about it is because NPR's Planet Money got wind of this and uh, did a FOIA request, Freedom, Freedom of Information Act. And they said, we heard about this, and if it exists, we want to see it. And so it was released. And that's why we are able to read the entire chapter, um, draft chapter, right? It was, it was never published. But the kinds of things that the White House staff and others were worried about are not the kinds of things that people here at the Levy Institute were worried about. While they were worried about how are we going to set interest rates and what about the benchmark and that sort of stuff, when Godley, Randy Ray were here around the same time saying, wait a minute, we're looking at the CBO's projections too. And what we want to do is understand them in the context of the sector financial balances. So they say here in this piece that they did together in 1999, what we want to do is determine what CBO's projections mean for the U.S. private sector, households and businesses together, private sector. Because in order for CBO's projections to make any sense, that's going to mean that the U.S. private sector is going to have to remain in a deficit position every single one of those years into the future. And those deficits are going to have to be on the order of about 8% of GDP. So private sector spending more than its income for 10, 15 years to the tune of 8% of GDP or so. So Randy and Wynn say it's implausible, it's absurd, it won't materialize. What's going to happen is the economy will go into recession, and then the budget will move from deficit, from surplus back into deficit. And so this is what they were looking at. This is when Godley's sector financial balance framework. So where you see the Clinton surpluses identified, those four years from 1998 to 2001, federal government budget is in surplus. You can see it there. But look at where the private sector was. That's the blue, below zero, those large deficits. That had not happened in the previous decades. It was unprecedented. And what Wynne was arguing along with Randy is that it was not only unprecedented, it was unsustainable. And people should have understood that. And they should have known that those Clinton surpluses couldn't continue unless the private sector stayed in that position for all those years. And that was not likely to happen. So here's Dimitri writing with Randy in 2001 already anticipating a recession and urging Congress to start thinking about how to counter the recession uh, when it happens. So in this piece, they say the evidence is now quite strong that 2001 will be a year of recession. Well, guess what? It was. So now I've added to that table I showed you before, years in which the government's budget moved into surplus, uh, and there was this belief that you were going to pay down debt. Well, you got a recession in 2001. So what does the administration do? What does Congress do? Well, some version of what Randy and Dimitri proposed, although the kinds of tax cuts they were talking about aren't the kind that uh, George W. Bush delivered, right? These were tax cuts that overwhelmingly benefited those at the top. Um, but it became sort of, let's cut taxes, increase the deficit. And this is where the famous line from Dick Cheney comes in, where Cheney says, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. We don't have to worry about the deficit. Let's just ramp it up and provide some fiscal support for the economy. So Bush cuts taxes in 2001, again in 2003, does a big prescription drug program, a couple of wars, lo and behold, you got enough spending to start to turn things around. So as you can see there, the Clinton surpluses disappear with Bush and the tax cuts and the wars and the recession and all the rest of it. And the deficit gets quite large and the private sector is restored, right? Its um, budget returns to the normal position, which is a surplus position. So what do we learn? All right. The deficit helps in the recovery, but it was still not a great recovery. We used to talk about V-shaped recoveries. This was not a V-shaped recovery. 2001 was kind of ugly, right? You can see there the, the number of months that it took 
to claw back the jobs that were lost in the 2001 recession, but eventually a recovery. All right, next recession, 2007-2009. Uh, we all know this as the global financial crisis and the Great Recession. Leading up to this point, here we go. It's 2003, right? It's 2003. Paul Krugman is writing in the New York Times, and he is lamenting the return of the budget deficit. And he says two years ago, the administration, the Bush administration, promised to run large surpluses. And now it says deficits don't matter. Just two years ago, the CBO was projecting a 10-year surplus of $5.6 trillion. Now it's projecting a 10-year deficit of $1.8 trillion. What's really scary, though, he says, is the threat to the government's solvency. Because of the Bush tax cuts, it's going to be even harder than before to continue programs like Social Security because of the fiscal imbalances. It'll be harder to cope with an aging population, Social Security and Medicare. Okay, fast forward a few years, Jason Furman, uh, who's, you know, went on to be um, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors and an important advisor to President Obama. Jason Furman, it's 2007. Think about that, January of 2007. He goes before Congress and he gives testimony. In that testimony, he says, I'm here to testify about one of the most important issues facing our nation, the long run budget deficit. The deficit today is 1.5% of GDP. The current account deficit is approaching 7% of GDP. My huge concern is the government deficit, and I am here to tell you we need to stem the flow of red ink, reduce the deficit, and deal with Social Security and Medicare. So let's put some numbers, okay? Current account deficit approaching 7%, put a plus 7 in the foreign bucket. Government deficit is only 1.5% of GDP, put a minus 1.5 in the government bucket. Where does that leave you? It leaves you with a U.S. private sector financial balance of minus 5.5% of GDP. So he's there testifying about the biggest crisis we face, the government deficit, totally ignoring the fact that while he's giving that testimony, this is the situation. That's 2007, the period that includes 2007. Private sector is back in deficit again. Hey, this is exactly where uh, Godley would say it doesn't belong. It's unsustainable, right? So 2007, start of the recession. December of 2007 is when the recession begins, the financial crisis. You know how the story unfolds. The queen famously asks, how did everybody miss this? Why didn't anybody see this coming, right? This huge financial crisis, this major economic meltdown why didn't anybody pick up on this? And uh, Professor Jamie Galbraith, who will show up here at some point, you'll get to interact with, Jamie writes a piece that says, no, 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 don't say, why didn't anybody see this coming? People did see this coming. Not a lot of people, but some people did. And some of the people that, got, that uh, Galbraith points to are in this building right now, right? They were doing important work along with Wynne Godley, and they were paying attention to the private sector indebtedness and, and seeing that as a driving right, cause of the ultimate economic meltdown. So credit goes there. All right, so everything hits the fan. Everything is melting down. Barack Obama has been elected president, but has not yet taken the oath of office. So he is working with his transition team. These are the people you rely on for advice, right? You're, you're going to take the White House and you build your team. I want a team of smart people, advisors around me to give me guidance. The economy is melting down. And President Obama says to uh, Christina Romer, who is a UC Berkeley professor and went on to become uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under Barack Obama. And he's got Larry Summers he's talking to and David Axelrod and Jared Bernstein, a whole team of people, right? So Christina Romer says to Barack Obama, well, Mr. President, this is your holy sh... Or, can I say that? It's your holy shit moment. It's worse than we thought. 
Okay, she writes a memo and she believes that the economy is going to need as much as $1.8 trillion in fiscal support because she's saying this is not a garden variety recession. This is not your normal slowdown. This is going to be bad. And so she's thinking on the order of $1.8 trillion. David Axelrod, who's very close to President Obama, you see him there, he said, my God, people will have sticker shock. You can't say the T word. Like trillion, can't, we can't. Larry Summers says, people will think we don't get it. We cannot stand up and say we need a trillion dollars or more than a trillion dollars to support. Like people will think we don't get it, is what he said. So here's Krugman, again, writing about the same time. Barack Obama hasn't taken the oath of office yet. It's clear things are bad. Krugman says, all indications are that the administration will offer a major stimulus package. My own back of the envelope calculations say the package should be huge on the order of $600 billion. So the question becomes, will the Obama people dare to propose anything that big? $600 billion. All right, so what do we get? The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. That was the major piece of legislation passed under the Obama administration to support the economy when the crisis started. $787 billion. More than Krugman, back of the envelope estimate, much less than Christina Romer's $1.8 trillion estimate. So how did it work out? Oh, I forgot to mention, Christina Romer's memo was kept from President Obama. He wasn't permitted to consider her advice. Who kept it from her? You got it. <laughs> Bingo. All right. So right around this time, I uh, start this blog. I'm teaching at UMKC with Matt Forstatter and Randy Ray and Bill Black and, and Pavlina is there. And we all decide that we want to try to weigh in and have a voice and try to shape in whatever way we might be able to, the policy discourse and the thinking around you know, fiscal policy. So we get involved. It doesn't do much good. By 2010, Barack Obama is delivering the State of the Union address. The economy is still in really bad shape. Unemployment is very high. He walks in to give the State of the Union address and he says, listen, if I had come in as president in normal times, there's nothing more I would have loved to do than to work on the deficit. But these weren't normal times. We had to spend some money to rescue the economy. So we took office amid a crisis, and now we're getting through it, and families are starting to tighten their belts, he says. And they're making tough decisions, and the federal government should do the same. Like any cash-strapped family, we got to work within a budget. And so starting next year, I'm prepared to freeze government spending for three years. This is the pivot to austerity, right? We're now shifting focus away from restoring the full health of the economy to paying attention to the budget outcome and saying, oh, we have to heal the budget. We have to reduce the deficit. Cheers and applause. Now watch. Who down? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yay. This is very good. Okay. So how does this work out? Not well. Not well at all. So let's go through this. This is actually <clears throat> taking us to a paper by Larry Summers. I'm going to show you where CBO thought that the U.S. economy would be operating, potential GDP. This is the forecast for 2000, from 2007. So pre-crisis, looking into the future, this is what potential GDP looked like relative to actual GDP. Okay, so we were pretty close to what conventionally people would call full employment. All right. Then the crisis started and real GDP went down and CBO revised downward its estimate of potential GDP, as you tend to do during a recession. But then it became clear this was not just any recession. This was the Great Recession. Real GDP really continued to plummet and the downward revision got much bigger. Potential GDP got revised way down and then the economy started to recover, but potential kept getting revised down, revised down. So by 2014, Larry says, look, it looks like we're getting closer to full employment because the difference between where you are and potential, the GDP gap, has narrowed. 
But Larry says the reason that it's narrowing is not so much that we are restoring the health of the economy, but that we are revising downward our definition of full employment. So in this paper that Larry publishes in 2014, he says, he writes these words. In other words, through this recovery, we have made no progress in restoring GDP to its potential. No progress. Okay. So somewhere in another room, maybe watching is uh, Joe Weisenthal, who's going to appear on a couple of panels later this afternoon. And Joe is quoted in this piece uh, in the Atlantic magazine. And the title of the piece is obviously, well, could a memo uh, written by Christina Romer have saved the economy? In other words, if we had done a better job with fiscal su support, fiscal policy, might we have had better outcomes? Um, and instead, this is what we got. So the employment recession, it took about 76 months, right? More than six years to claw back all of the jobs that were lost in the Great Recession, a very, very poor uh, economic outcome, right? Dismal, really. All right, so the next recession is the most recent, 2020. How's my time? I'm gonna take a peek. I have no idea. I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, wave at me if, I, if I'm getting too close to time. So, so the most recent recession, let's get to the lead up to this. All right, you saw the last picture, that terrible recovery. This person enters the fray and says, I am here to help. Help is on the way. He goes into communities across the nation and says, we're going to make America great again. Help is on the way. I hear you, and I hear you saying you're in pain, and I hear you saying everything's not great. Help is on the way, right? And he says things in the debates with Secretary Clinton uh, over deficit spending and so forth. He said, you got to spend. You got to spend or you die on the vine. He said at one point, he, I'm not worried about the debt. So he, we print the money. It's our money. It's our currency, he said. I'm not, I'm not going to get dragged into this. Now, he's been on both sides of this argument, to be sure. But he did say these things. His White House chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, at one point, while Trump was president, said, nobody cares about the deficit anymore. Like, we're, we're on to bigger things, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, somebody <laughs> did care about the deficit still. Uh, this is Paul Krugman writing in 2017. Deficits matter again. Oh, boy. So running big deficits is no longer harmless, let alone desirable. Full employment has been more or less restored. So we're now at the point where basically government borrowing competes with the private sector for a limited amount of money. This means deficit spending doesn't provide much economic boost because it drives up interest rates and crowds out private investment. Straight up loanable funds stuff, right? Textbook stuff. Republicans are about to blow up the deficit at a time when it will do real harm. Okay. Right around the same time, later that year, the Republicans are getting ready to pass their tax cuts. And they have these huge tax cuts proposed, and people like Larry Summers and Paul Krugman don't like them, right? I didn't like them, but not for the same reasons. So here's Bob Rubin, right, former Treasury Secretary. He is speaking out against the Republican tax cuts. They hadn't passed yet, and he's saying, listen, if we have a crisis, whether it's a financial crisis or just a regular business cycle recession, we aren't going to have the fiscal policy space to respond or monetary policy because rates were so low, he said. Um, and it's scary. We don't have a fiscal arsenal to fight back because these tax cuts they want to pass. Larry Summers says, our country will be living on a shoestring for decades because of the increases in the deficits that will result from these tax cuts. It's a serious threat to our national security because what it will mean over time for our ability to fund our national defense. This is both of these people were treasury secretary and they're saying we are going to run out of money. We're not going to have the ability to spend when we need to, to, to deal with a crisis. Well, guess what? We had a crisis. Oh, and I wrote this piece for Bloomberg. I was a uh, contributing columnist there for a little period of time. And I said, no, 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 don't listen to that. You got to use fiscal policy to fight the next recession. And of course, that's what we did. COVID hit. And you remember March of 2020, right? It becomes clear that we're in real trouble. 
And that month, Congress puts together a bill called the CARES Act, $2.2 trillion. Nobody wrung their hands about the deficit. Nobody said, where will the money come from? Whose taxes are going to go up to pay for it? None of that. They wrote a bill. They committed to the spending. 2.2 out the door. Off you go. Later that year, they did another bill, $900 billion package in December of 2020. And then Biden gets elected and comes in. And in March of 2021, they do a $1.9 trillion package. You add $2.2 trillion to $900 billion to $1.9 trillion, you get $5 trillion. So in 12 months' time, we did $5 trillion, committed $5 trillion in fiscal support. Right? No problemo. We weren't out of money. We weren't out of ammo. We had the Congress had the fiscal capacity to do what needed to be done because the deficits of the past don't constrain the government's ability to commit financial resources at any point in the future, right? Not only did we do all that, there was a bipartisan infrastructure package. And then, of course, there's never any problem funding defense, right? We, we increase the amount always. All right. So what did we get? We got a much, much better outcome. Look at the Look at the recovery from in terms of jobs, right? This was a very rapid snapback. We didn't stretch this thing out five, seven years trying to claw back the jobs. They came back very, very fast. And the fiscal response was completely different. It was far more robust, right? It wasn't a one and done. You got a package and another package and another package and Congress stayed committed. And the reward for staying committed was, of course, restoring growth and jobs very, very quickly. Now, along with the restoration of jobs and the rapid growth and so forth, obviously came inflation. So let's talk about that. In April of last year, so more than a year ago, I had a very long piece in the New York Times. Uh, and I, was, uh, I wrote a lot about inflation in that piece. And after that piece came out, Jason Furman tweeted this. Now even Stephanie Kelton is worried about overheating. Her piece is filled with ideas about how to constrain inflation, but she conspicuously avoids the most obvious one. Monetary policy, the Fed will do it. The Fed will fix it, right? Krugman then weighs in. This conversation is ongoing, and he says, but mainstream economists say inflation uh, from overheating can always be contained by monetary policy, but MMTers don't believe in monetary policy for unclear reasons. Okay, unclear. So here is Warren Mosler's white paper where he talks about why MMT is skeptical, at, to say the least, of monetary policy as the right and potent tool to alleviate inflationary pressure, it may even be the case that raising interest rates uh, doesn't work the way everybody thinks it does, which is that it reduces inflationary pressures. We might actually have it backwards. It might actually accelerate inflationary pressures. Okay, it might. It might, he says. So tightening by the Fed by increasing rates may increase total spending and foster price increases, contrary to the advertised and intended effects of bringing down inflation. Here is Professor Jamie Galbraith saying exactly the same thing. Uh, tighter credit would get in the way of business investment that the economy needs to build more capacity to be able to absorb the higher demand. Uh, it, higher interest rates get in the way of that. They uh, are a cost. And to the extent that firms pass costs on to end consumers, rising interest rates means rising costs to business. And they may just raise prices to protect their margins. So you raise interest rates, you may end up with higher prices. So he says higher costs lead to inflation in the short run until the Fed tightens so much that it brings about a recession, right? And then it cracks the economy. Here again, Dimitri writing with Randy just in uh, recent weeks or months, um, picking up a paper that really building on what you did in 1994, I think. The first flying blind paper was in 1994, and now they're reviving it and saying, gosh, after all this time, the Fed is still flying blind. So what do they say? 
And they say the Federal Reserve has much less control over spending and therefore inflation than is widely taken to be the case. Changes in the federal funds rate may in some cases have the opposite effects of those that are commonly assumed. Just as fiscal policy should be elevated as the primary tool of macroeconomic management, not just when you're against the zero lower bound, but fiscal policy should be in the driver's seat. And it's the more durable, reliable uh, policy lever. Just as fiscal should be um, primary in terms of macro policy management, it's fiscal, regulatory, and other policy tools that should play a greater role in addressing inflation. Don't look to the Fed, is the argument. Now, I'm sitting at home drinking coffee in the morning, as I do every morning, with CNBC on, as I do every morning. And I'm watching Andrew Ross Sorkin interview Ben Bernanke. This is like two weeks ago, three weeks ago at most. And uh, Sorkin says, so you say the Fed should lead the effort to fight inflation. Is it because there's no other tool? Kelton sips her coffee and Ben Bernanke says, well, in theory, the fiscal authority could play a role. This is what modern monetary theory says, that by raising taxes and cutting spending, reducing aggregate demand, the fiscal authority could play the same kind of role as the Fed. Unfortunately, the Fed is just a lot more nimble. Well, okay, so here's where we are. The Fed is tightening. The Fed is trying to reduce inflation because that's the tool they have. Everything looks like, you know, uh, what is the saying when all you have is a hammer? every inflation problem looks like an excess demand nail. It's got to be excess demand, we'll nail it down. But at the same time, economists are starting to also think in terms of other levers that can be pulled, not just relying on the Fed. So I listened the other day and I hear that, in fact, there is a group of Democrats who are working with some economists on a bill to reduce inflation. What are the kinds of things they're looking at? Well, some of the things that were in my New York Times op-ed, as a matter of fact, that were sort of ridiculed as, you know, all these ideas, but you're overlooking the most obvious one. Well, now people are looking for other ideas. So here's a piece that got a lot of attention. I'm almost done. Uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, President Biden had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago. What was it? May, May 30th, so very recently. And Biden said, here's my plan for fighting inflation. Number one, Leave the Fed alone and let it do its job. Don't interfere with the Fed, right? Number one. Number two, do what we can proactively to deal with the supply chain bottlenecks and the ports and all the other stuff, right? So he's got a whole list of things. Build more capacity. Number three, cut the deficit. Cut the deficit even more. This will help to reduce inflation. So here's another article, Randy and Yeva writing just earlier this year. Reducing the deficit pulls demand out of the economy, slows growth, and increases unemployment. At approximately the same time, the Fed chooses to raise interest rates, adding to the economic headwinds. Now, they're looking at the history of recessions, but they're saying this is the way it tends to go. The deficit falls, and the Fed hikes, and the combination of the two pushes the economy into recession. And so that's what the picture looks like. If you look at the federal government's budget outcome, deficit or surplus, and just plot it against unemployment, it's pretty obvious how these things move together, right? Endogenously, as the economy improves, the unemployment rate falls, and the deficit naturally shrinks. As the economy goes into recession, unemployment rises, and the deficit uh, automatically increases. So what CBO is forecasting now is that the deficit is gonna to continue to shrink, the unemployment rate is gonna to continue to fall. But against that, you have the headwinds of an attempt to actively reduce the deficit along with higher interest rates. So the Fed says, we're just trying to restore health. We think that the labor market is out of whack. We have so many job openings that it's unhealthy. What we wanna do is restore health to the labor market they say they want to see the number of openings come down, not so much that they want to drive unemployment up. But if you look at the way these two things are sort of related to one another, you don't see anywhere here um, a period in which you reduce the number of job openings without unemployment increasing.
So it's unemployment is going to increase. So this is the question. I'm focusing on whatever this next recession is, because we're going to have one. The big debate now is whether it starts this year, next year, or whether it's already started. There are some economists who think we're already in a recession. Uh, some think that it, it could happen later this year. Some people believe it will be next year, but almost everyone seems now to be of the mind that the U.S. economy is going to go into recession. I think from a Levy, sector balance, godly lens, you can see why that is likely to happen. So I don't know what we're going to call it, and I don't know exactly when you know, the timing will work out, but we're headed that way. Thank you very much.